Thank you for downloading this episode of In Our Time. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. In 1819, the retired American president, Thomas Jefferson, wrote to his former secretary, giving a revealing account of his personal philosophy. I, too, am an Epicurean, he said. I consider the genuine doctrines of Epicurus as containing everything rational in moral philosophy which Greece and Rome have left us. Epicureanism was one of the major philosophical schools of ancient Greece. It was founded in the 4th century BC by Epicurus, an Athenian who taught that the aim of human life was pleasure. His followers were wary of politics and religion, cast off their fear of death and stressed the importance of friendship. Epicurean ideas were a major influence on Renaissance thinkers and offered a radical view of the universe that anticipated far later scientific discoveries such as Darwinian evolution and even quantum mechanics. With me to discuss Epicureanism are Angie Hobbs, Professor of the Public Understanding of Philosophy at the University of Sheffield, David Sedley, Lawrence Professor of Ancient Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, and James Warren, Reader in Ancient Philosophy, also at the University of Cambridge. Angie Hobbs, would you begin by telling us about who Epicurus was and what's known about him? Yes, he seems to have been a very likeable, even lovable man. He was born in 341 BC on the island of Samos, and he died in 270 BC in Athens. As a young man, he studied under a follower of Democritus, who was, of course, one of the founders of the atomic theory, and that was clearly going to be the basis of his future thought. When he was 18, he moves to Athens for two years to do the compulsory military service, and then he spent about 15 years travelling around the eastern Mediterranean, uh, teaching and setting up his own philosophical circles. Then when he's 34, he comes back to Athens, buys a house and the even more famous garden and sets up this philosophical community of friends, including women and slaves. And there they um, live this very simple life. Epicurus says that um, cheese is enough to turn uh, bread and water into a feast. He treasures his friendships. He doesn't seem to have married or had children himself. And he writes prodigiously. He worked very, very hard in this garden. We uh, Apparently there were 300 scrolls that he left. So he wrote on physics, astronomy, uh, ethics, psychology, theory of knowledge, theory of language. So enormously um, prodigious output. You mentioned the garden twice. For listeners to know how significant the garden was, his philosophical school was known as the garden. Yes, yes. yes. Right. I don't Could know if they did any actual gardening. Give us, Cindy, can you give us, you began there, but can you give us e- even more information about the range of his philosophical concerns? OK, so the primary natural good is pleasure, and pleasure is the only thing that's good in itself, and it's the criterion by which we judge the value of absolutely everything else, including uh, virtue even. The maximum um, of pleasure is reached when we attain a state of tranquility, where we're free from bodily pain and free from mental cares and anxieties, particularly religious superstitions about divine retribution and the fear of death. We'll be coming to that in a moment, but I was thinking of the range in terms of he, he seems to have studied physics and astronomy and written about a great number of different subjects. Yes, we, we've got his... Uh, there, there are remnants of his work on nature, in which he talks about uh, the physics we have. Uh, he also touches on that in his um, one of his letters. We've got the ethics, which we have um, in his letter to Menoikius. We've got astronomy in the letter to Pythocles. Uh, we've got the canon um, on epistemology. Uh, yes, an enormous, an enormous range. But the centre of it was this pleasure that you, you were then talking about. James Warren, how much of Epicurus' work has survived, and in what form? Why do we know so much about him? Well, we're very fortunate in the case of Epicurus because, um, perhaps unusually compared with some of his contemporaries, some um, complete works of his have survived. Angie's already mentioned these letters, uh, letters to friends that set out... There are three of them that we have in, in, uh, that are complete that set out, uh, in summary, his major teachings in physics and the theory of knowledge in natural philosophy and cosmology and then ethics. Those come down to us um, because they were cited in full by a later ancient writer who wrote biographies of the philosophers. He was called Diogenes Laertius. 
and they've survived through the standard means of transmission by which these ancient works come down to us. They were copied through later antiquity, through the Renaissance and so on. We also have works by Epicurus, various Epicurean followers, um, perhaps most prominently um, the complete poem by uh, the Roman poet Lucretius that was written in the first century BC that also came down in that similar transmission tradition. But for Epicureanism, we also are fortunate to have two very unusual sources of evidence. So first of all, we have a more or less um, <clears throat> preserved library that was owned by a must have been a very rich Roman senator in his villa just outside Herculaneum in southern Italy. Now, this was covered in the eruption of 79 AD, and the, the scrolls of papyrus were carbonized and preserved in that way, and they were discovered in the 17th century. So this is a case of direct transmission of ancient texts. And this library contains some more texts of Epicurus that we didn't otherwise have, but also texts by other Epicureans, perhaps later Epicureans, including someone like Philodemus. Um, that we'll perhaps talk about later. The, the second unusual case is an enormous wall um, from uh, southwest Turkey that was set up sometime probably in the middle of the 2nd century AD by a well-meaning citizen of the town who decided what his townspeople really needed was an 80-metre-long, 3.5-metre-tall wall inscribed with various of Epicurus' teachings and, indeed, his own Epicurean thoughts on the world. And the, how how did that survive? One, well, it's already astonishing that Lava and that Vesuvius, his work turned out to have great benefits in that case. And we may find. But how did the wall survive? Didn't well, it somebody... survives in fragments. It's yes. not there intact. And um, various painstaking efforts have been made to try and excavate and then read and reconstruct what we have. Some of it was reused, and you can go to the village and see bits of it on the floor still lying down. So. Um, we're very fortunate in that it hasn't been more disturbed than it is. His philosophical system, was it? Was it founded on the idea that everything we see consists of atoms? If so, where did it get it from and where did it lead him to? Yes, his physical system sets out with the idea that everything in the world is either a body or it's void or it's some combination of these two. Uh, this isn't novel with him. There were people a um, hundred and so years before him, including Democritus, that I think we've already mentioned, who may have originated this idea. But we have, from Epicurus, the first detailed exposition of his argument for this view. And it's, it's rather interesting. He sets out um, from the idea that um, <coughs> our senses tell us that there are bodies in the world. There's no doubt about that. And they also tell us that there must be void, because otherwise there'd be nowhere for the bodies to be, and the bodies wouldn't be able to move because everything would be full up and there'd be no motion possible. If you add to this two other thoughts, the first that nothing can come to be out of nothing and the second that nothing ever disappears entirely out of nothing, um, plus the idea that we see things around us change and grow and decay, the idea is that those things that we see around us can't be these fundamental bodies. They must be made up of further tiny un uh, indivisible bodies of which there are uh, innumerable numbers of them. They, uh, they've lasted forever. The void goes on forever, spatially and temporally. And our cosmos is just happens to be a collection of them that's around at the moment. It seems, uh, uh, David said, this idea of discovering atoms by thinking that it was like art, rather than by any examination, obviously no microscopes, obviously none of the machinery, as it were, technology, uh, of the last three or four hundred years, is an astonishing uh, act of thought, isn't it? But he had this atomic... He thought that there were a great number of atoms. Did he think there were an infinite number or a finite number? And that they swerved around, they collided with each other, and, and they made up everything. They made up the gods, they made up the yes. humans, they made up everything. And therefore, there was no division between the gods and the humans. Um, well, in, in, you're right. Yes, there's, there's a lot in, in that. Uh, first of all, yes, there are infinitely many a atoms moving around in infinite space. Uh, space must be infinite because it, it, uh, they, it seems to simply to be incoherent. Suppose that space could come to an end. The question arises, what would mark the end? Wouldn't there be something beyond it to mark it? Uh, given that space is infinite, the atoms must be infinitely many as well because if there were only finitely many atoms in an infinite void, then they would be infinitely thinly distributed so they'd never come together to form a world like ours. But given that there are infinitely many atoms um, in infinite void, it's entirely possible to, for what we see to have happened to have happened maybe namely that they've come together into complex patterns of motion which produce worlds like ours. 
But given that, that the atoms obey what could could be called with the later phraseology laws of gravity and uh, and um, moving in the way they are, he hit on a problem, as I understand it from reading what you three have written, uh, where does that leave free will? If these things are predetermined and whizzing right. around on predetermined causes, uh, causes, sorry, what does that mean for free will? Right, this was... The, um, the, here we have a major difference between Epicurus and Democritus. Democritus uh, had insisted that everything uh, changes uh, as a result as, of upwards causation uh, f- from the bottom up and m- mechanically determine motions of atoms. They bounce off each other in r- certain regular patterns. Everything that happens is predetermined by the, lo- the laws of physics. It's like the billiard ball universe that later became familiar. Uh, and... Uh, Epicurus, who, though he was an enormous admirer of Democritus, and indeed, uh, as a young man, he called himself a, a Democritean, uh, but he said that Democritus had unwittingly gone wrong here because he created the problem of determinism without realising its consequences. Epicurus uh, objected, that can't be right because... Uh, if, if uh, Democritus was right, we would all just be helpless spectators of our own body's actions, and those actions would be predetermined for the rest of our lives. Uh, that would make um, morality un- uh, impossible, and it would simply conflict with our experience, which tells us that we are, we are, and perhaps other animals too, are capable of initiating genuinely new courses of motion. So Epicurus concluded that determinism, as pr- uh, described by Democritus, simply cannot be true. What uh, does? How does one get out of a determinism answer, there must be a, at least a minimal degree of indeterminism. And Epicurus introduced this famous, but uh, I should also say notorious doctrine, the swerve. That is the doctrine that an atom, when travelling in a straight line, may at um, no predictable place or time, very, very slightly, just to a minimal degree, change its course. Uh, and this means that uh, although there's still um, overwhelming regularity in nature, there's just a fractional uh, d- deviation which can't be predicted. And this is enough to in- determine that the laws of physics alone are not sufficient to predetermine everything that happens. And somehow uh, that is meant to leave room for, for something like what we would call free will. It's a huge question whether actually uh, the idea of atomic indeterminacy helps to explain free will. And that's a problem, that, uh, an interpretive problem that's still with us. But if I could just add... Please. Uh, <coughs> Please. Uh, the, the problem of explaining how a degree of indeterminacy in the motion of atoms can help to account for free will, recurred in the most fascinating way uh, after the long reign of Newtonian physics. In 1928, when Heisenberg published his uncertainty principle, it turned out that Epicurus was basically right. There is, at the subatomic level, a small degree of genuine unpredictability and indeterminacy. And scientists and philosophers threw up their hands in relief and said, at last we can go back to believing in free will because determinism turns out not to be true. But when they came down to the question... How does it, uh, the indeterminacy in, let's say, the motion of a given electron at a given time, how does that actually help to explain free will? Exactly the same problems arose as uh, arise in the interpretation of Epicurus. I love it. From Epicurus to Heisenberg <laughs> in, one, in one elegant sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. And Angie Hobbs, uh, what's Epicurus' view of how we can come to knowledge about the world? OK, so we, we need to emphasise again that absolutely everything is composed of atoms and void, including our souls and our minds, absolutely everything. So it's a mechanistic theory, it's an empiricist theory, and it, it has a basic trust in human sensation and a denial of mind-body dualism. So Epicurus says we all have sensations, and he asserts, as far as I can see without argument, though uh, David and James might Uh, correct me here, that the causes of these sensations must come from things outside the sensations themselves. What are these things that cause our sensations? And he says, well, there are these very thin atomic films um, which are usually effluences from the surface of physical objects, though not always, but usually which float off from those surfaces and enter into our bodies, enter into our sense organs. Then through a complex process, which we can return to if we want, um, those, that sort of uh, filmic input is converted into um, what we call a sense impression, a fantasia. Now, the, the fantasia is an accurate and true report 
and the same word in Greek, alephes, is, means both accurate or true and real. It's an accurate and true report of the atomic films at the stage they are when they enter our bodies. And we're accurate about our impressions of those films when they enter our eyes or ears. And these films, this is emanations from, say, that bottle exactly. of water in front of me. But is... Exactly. Right. But that does not mean to say that the films which enter our sense organs are exactly the fi- in the same state as they were when they left the physical body, because it might have been some distance away and the intervening medium, air or water, might have altered the atomic structure. Um, So what we can say for sure is that our sense impressions accurately report the films as they enter us. There's still a plenty of room for um, error in how we interpret those sense impressions with the mind, and we can get all sorts of things wrong. We may not realise that the straight oar um, in water is going to appear bent to us over the distance. We may have become confused um, and think that the rainbow is actually represents a solid object that we could slide down or that the mirage really does indicate a pool of water that we can drink from. So there's plenty of room for error at that stage, but not at the stage of the sense impressions themselves. James Warren, can we <clears throat> take many Greek philosophers were sceptics and they believed that in a sense it was impossible really to, to know anything. How does that play, if I can use a disgraceful really word, come to think of it, uh, with what Angie's been saying? Well, the way <coughs> Angie's explained it is um, Epicurus's physical doctrine of perception and how that might bolster his confidence in the way our senses work. And in the way we gather knowledge. That's right. That's the, sort of, um, well, that's the, that's the track we're on at the moment. But you're quite right that um, for a long time various Greek philosophers, in fact most Greek philosophers, would have been sceptics of one stripe or another. They vary from people who say we can't know anything at all to people who say on occasion our senses might be a a little uh, wonky and not quite tell us the truth. Um, Now, let's remember that at some point in his establishment of atomic theory, Epicurus has relied on the senses. He said our senses tell us that there are bodies in the world and they tell us that things move. So it had better not be solely on the basis of that atomic theory that he then tells us that's why we can rely on our senses because otherwise there'd be something of an argumentative circle there. So he goes on the attack against the sceptics. He says, really, if if you look at how a sceptic lives their life, they don't really disbelieve what their senses tell them. No one really doesn't leave a room by the door or um, walks out into the road in front of moving traffic because they really don't believe the way that their eyes are telling them things look. So he has a pragmatic attack on the sceptics. He also takes um, on their various arguments because some of them are based on the supposition that um, two sense impressions might conflict. And if two sense impressions conflict, these sceptics argue they can't both be true, so at least one of them is false. And if we can't tell which is false, then we ought to be careful which ones we, we believe to in. To come back, just to help, and then please go on, Ange, one of Angie's examples of the oar in the water. We know it's a straight blade of wood going into the water, but we see it as a bent wood in the that's water. That's right, yes. and you might take that as a suggestion that at least one of our senses must be telling us something that's not true. One of our senses tells us it's bent, and the other one says it's not. But Epicurus says, if you think carefully, they're not really conflicting. It really does look bent, at least the part of it that enters the water as it as we would say the light refracts makes it look bent but if you run your finger along it it would feel straight but th- these don't conflict it looks one way and feels the other there's no logical conflict between those two david sedley um central goal of his life according to epicurus is pleasure this is the thing that most people remember and angie began to talk about it earlier on what did he mean when he used the word pleasure and, and uh why, and anyway, let's just start with that. What did he mean by when he used the word pleasure? Uh, well, Epicurus is not really into definitions, so we don't expect him to answer your question with, uh, as Plato would have done with a definition. Rather, he says, pleasure is an immediate datum of experience from birth. Every human, um, newborn infant, pr- probably every other animal as well, uh, from the moment of birth, recognises uh, pleasure um, uh, as the good. 
and uh, pain as the bad. Uh, so uh, he says it, it's as obvious what pleasure is and what its value is as it is that snow is cold and that fire is hot. None of that needs justification. Uh, but what Epicurus... So what he, he contributes to, um, beyond that is a much a gradually refined idea of uh, of what kinds of pleasure there are and what their relative values are. And that's how his hedonist system is going to be built up. So if I could just elaborate a bit, uh, uh, the fami- f- familiar notion of pleasure, uh, the one that everyone experiences from birth, is positive sensory stimulation of a, of a welcome kind. And pain is uh, as a, as a negative sensory stimulation of a certain kind. That's what we start from. Uh, and Epicurus calls those, um, has a technical term for it, he calls them kinetic pleasures. Uh, but uh, what is not in initially clear but becomes clear is that actually uh, simply the, the simple removal of pain uh, is itself a kind of pleasure because uh, although the process, let's take drinking, suppose though the process of quenching thirst is itself a pleasure because, as, because you're drinking, the pleasure... Or, sorry, I should say the state of having your thirst now quenched so that you're not in pain in that respect is itself a pleasant state. Not only is it a pleasant state, but the remarkable claim he makes, which uh, earned him a good deal of uh, criticism from, uh, from other schools, is that it is as pleasant uh, uh, as a, a kinetic pleasure. He calls these static pleasures, and the, uh, there, there are two kinds. There's the static pleasure of not... Um, being any bodily pain. If you're not hungry or thirsty or cold, then you are in, in a state of static pleasure. Uh, and uh, most, what most people think, quite incorrectly according to Epicurus, is that you can in, in further enhance that state by adding, for example, luxuries. So if you've already had an, enough to eat, if you have a box of chocolates as well, most people would think you've added an extra pleasure, a kinetic one, and that's a, 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 a an increased sum total of pleasure. Not so, according to Epicurus. What the additional pleasures do, the glass of port after dinner or the chocolate, is vary your state of pleasure, but they don't actually increase it. I think this is his... Although this is counterintuitive, it's his way of putting a point that's often put in um, po- in popular thought by saying that being rich doesn't, enab- doesn't make you happy, it just enables you to be miserable in comfort. Mere- merely adding... Uh, people think that you can have the pleasantest life simply by accumulating as many kinetic pleasures as possible, one luxury after another. Actually, the height of pleasure is achieved when um, all the pain is gone. Now, I just have to add one more distinction, which is of great importance to him. Uh, We've so far been talking about bodily pleasures, and those are the ones through which we learn the nature of pleasure. But the ones that are really important are are mental pleasures. Uh, Mental pleasures um, are, are superior partly because with your mind, you can enjoy all your past pleasures and all your future pleasures. You can look forward, you can reminisce. Uh, so the, the mind is a much more sa- powerful source of pleasure um, th- um, than the body. Moreover, the most pleasant state that you could possibly achieve would be one of mental painlessness. You've got, if you get rid of all the fears you have, the fear of God, the fear of death, any fear of pain, any other fears um, of what the world can throw at you, then you are in um, the, most, the, the highest state of pleasure. And that is really the, the, the essence of Epic, or the, the basis from which he develops his account of the good life. Andrew Hobbs, can you take that on? I mean, how do we set about obtaining these pleasures? Well, this is where the connections uh, between the different aspects of, democ- uh, sorry, of Epicurus's writing are so important because he's going to make it very clear that though the the goal of his philosophy is this life of pleasure uh, conceived as freedom from care, you can only attain that if you understand the nature of things, if you understand the physical structure of the universe and the nature of the gods, and that if you understand that the gods have no control over our lives, have no control over what happens after our deaths because... Our deaths are simply going to be the dispersal of our souls and death is going to be nothing to us. Once you've come to understand those things, then you can set about achieving uh, contentment and satisfaction in this life without worrying about what the gods have in store for you. Now, of course, many people have not felt that Epicurus has got rid of the fear of death by saying we're going to be obliterated at death, but but he thought he had. So reason and understanding are crucial here, and, and so are the virtues. The virtues, as we've seen, are not good in themselves. They're good as means to the life of tranquility. Um, 
So prudence, uh, self-control, courage, these are all things that are going to help us understand the nature of things, do the hedonic calculus, weigh up the pleasures and pains in our own life. So we might accept a short-term pain and to get a long-term greater good and vice and avoid um, a short-term good um, because we think it would bring us a greater long-term pain. And, and also in order to help us deal with pain and evil and suffering in the right way and to understand that if they can be born with fortitude, and as David was saying, we always have recourse to memory of past pleasures um, and if you think you're going to live, you have the anticipation of future ones. So in all these ways, we can use our rational understanding and our virtues to help us achieve this life. It's a very self-disciplined life. It's not remotely the, the sybaritic excess of indulgence that it was later portrayed as by, by Christians and others. Before, before I turn to James Warren, just to sort of put a little pierce, if I may, to what you're saying, Angie, he, he doesn't think that the gods have any, uh, have anything much to do with this because they must be successfully happy and why would they want to bother with us lot Ex if they were happy because we'd give them nothing but well, trouble. Exactly. He says you've got to choose. You, you've got this view that the gods uh, live this life of utter blessedness and, and peace and freedom from care and then you've also got this view that the gods are concerned with human affairs and bother about rewards and punishments. You can't have both. Which is the most important belief? And he says you're Surely the crux of your belief is that the gods are supremely, blessedly happy and peaceful, so they're not going to bother with messy old humans. Yeah, well, back to the messy old humans uh, here. Uh, but James, one, would you explain the importance of friendship uh, in Epicureanism, which caught a lot of people's attention and uh, pansy for centuries? That's right. So it's obvious that friendship played an important part in the way the Epicurean community was structured. And also Epicurus places a great stress on friendship as um, one of those sources of mental pleasures that David was talking about. That having friends to talk to, to discuss philosophy with, to chat over dinner, is going to be one way in which you can maintain your mental tranquility and feel happy about your own lives. Some people have found that there might be a problem with this, though, because as we've been developing his view of the good life, the idea seems to be that each person should be doing their best to structure their lives and their desires and their beliefs and so on in order to make sure that they live a life that's as pain-free as possible and as full of pleasure as possible. Now, <clears throat> people's friendships differ, obviously, but sometimes it seems that friendships involve putting yourself out on behalf of a friend. And some people have worried whether Epicurus can make room for a genuine sense of altruism within his, what seems like, an egoistic, hedonistic recipe for an individual's happiness. There's some evidence, I think, that some of the ancient Epicureans felt some pressure to give an account of this too. Um, there's a sequence of uh, thoughts in uh, a work by Cicero, who is no friend of Epicurus, um, where he relates various possible stories that Epicureans came up with about how to make room for friendship within their good life. Some of them say, well, perhaps you start out um, in a sort of contract with a friend. I agree to help you out when you need help and you agree to help me out when we need help and we both benefit. But over time, perhaps, a genuine sense of other regard might develop. Um, whatever you think about that, it's clear that um, the Epicureans do want to say that there's some genuine positive hedonic value, a genuine pleasure to be had in genuine friendship, in having that confidence that your friends are there when you need them, and engaging in the kinds of activities that friends do for one another. That's part and parcel of how they will see a good, happy human life. David Sedley, Epicurus encapsulated his core beliefs in a formulation known as tetrapharmakos. Is that how you pronounce that it? That is correct, yes. Well, thank you. Right, what does that word mean? It means the fourfold remedy, and it's actually a metaphor borrowed from medicine. There really was a kind of medicine with four ingredients known as the tetrapharmakos, uh, but Epicurus adapted it um, uh, to the idea that philosophy is also a kind of medicine, namely the medicine of the soul, and um, Epicurus devoted a, a large part of his ethical writing to uh, attempts to show how we can actually memorise and master uh, the principles which will heal the soul and heal it above all of fear, because fear, fear of death and fear of God, he thinks these are the two 
uh, great, great things that, that blight our lives. And here's how it goes. God holds no fears, death holds no worries. And while good can easily be attained, so too evil can readily be endured. Now, all of the content of that has already been covered by things we've said, but I'll just sort of very briefly um, say what they are. God is not to be feared. That's because, as Angie has explained, once you understand the true divine nature, you realise no divine being would take an interest in you, let alone be malevolent towards you. The, the death holds no worries. Well, this is because there's a whole battery of arguments designed to show that uh, since the, the human soul uh, is simply made of atoms, when the body is destroyed, the soul will be dissipated with it. There, there is no survival of death. Therefore, death is non-existence. Non-existence is not to be feared because you can't experience it. You're not there to experience it. So that's uh, the second item. The third one, good can be easily be attained. That's because all you have to do in order to achieve Epicurean pleasure is to satisfy your your basic necess- natural and necessary desires, uh, and those are very easily satisfied. And the, what that leaves is the one that we haven't really touched on much, which is um, evil can be endured. That's to say pain can be endured, because that's the one remaining fear an Epicurean is in danger of having. What if I suffer in te- an illness with intense pain? The answer is that there are strategies for enduring pain. Uh, Epicurus, on his own deathbed, described in a letter he wrote the intense pain he was suffering, but he said that was completely outweighed by the pleasure he got in reliving past conversations with his his friends. So um, that's one of the strategies. You use the the power of memory to overcome bodily pain. And the other is, uh, this is something on which Epicurus has not been found generally convincing, uh, at least in modern times, although... Uh, uh, they were, they, he had his ancient admirers on the point. P- uh, severe pain can be endured because it doesn't last long. Uh, mild pains uh, are, are tolerable anyway. If the pain is severe enough, uh, it'll it'll be short lived, and that presumably what he means is it'll kill you. Uh, so you can deal with that as long as you realise that uh, you're going to pass very quickly to a state of of painlessness. James Warren, what competing philosophical uh, systems existed at that time. Was he a... Uh, well, that's a question. Well, in Athens of his day, um, there were still uh, followers of Plato about, of various sorts, in the academy. Um, Aristotle's school was still a going concern, the Lyceum. And then, perhaps a generation after Epicurus, Stoicism came on the scene. Uh, again, a, a philosophy drawing its inspiration from Socrates, like many others of the time. But that became perhaps its major competitor for the remainder of the Hellenistic period and on into uh, the Roman world. Stoicism, in many ways, is quite different from Epicurus on all major philosophical topics. So they believed that our, our world is unique and it's, the, it's governed thoroughly and maintained by a rational divine force that makes sure everything is for the best. They stressed the importance of living virtuously in harmony with this cosmic nature rather than living for pleasure and so on. Um, So in many ways, uh, the Epicureans and they were easy to set against one another in terms of debates or in terms of discussions. There are also various kinds of sceptics still on the scene um, urging us not to um, form knowledge because it's much too difficult and we can never be sure about the world. Can we, uh, David Sedley, um, can we just talk about how, how how his influence, how his teachings moved through uh, from 300 BC into the Roman age and, and what it encounters, what it takes to itself and so on? Well, uh, the Epicureans were regarded uh, in their own day as um, very conservative in the sense that they were thought to be are very committed to the um, the word of the founder of the school. It wasn't actually just Epicurus, but Epicurus and uh, his three leading associates, Polyinus, Metrodorus and Hermarchus, their words were treated as kind of canonical. So it, the outside perception was that the school didn't really adapt very much. Uh, it simply went back to the to the Epicurean Gospels, but the reality is is very different from that. It did actually it moved into the Roman world uh, as 
particularly around, starting, around, say, around 100 BC, uh, the power of Rome in the Mediterranean had grown. Uh, Athens, where, which had been where the, the centre for philosophical schools, was in decline. Uh, and Philodemus, who James mentioned earlier, is a very good example of the way that uh, Epicureanism adapted itself to, uh, to the Roman world. Philodemus had studied and lived and worked in Athens, but he, uh, sometime in the early 1st century BC, he moved... Uh, uh, westwards uh, set up a school uh, in the in the Naples region. This was the, uh, uh, probably at Herculaneum, and there um, he, that was a, a very well chosen spot because it was where wealthy and powerful Romans went to spend their leisure time. Campania, the area around, around Naples, and there he he won the ear of many influential Romans. For example, um, Piso the the um, the father-in-law of Julius Caesar, Horace and Virgil, the poets, had Epicurean backgrounds in the Naples region at that time. So we could get a very clear sign of not only of Epicureanism adapting uh, to different um, uh, polit- geopolitical circumstances, but also adapting itself to the, the, the cultural interests um, of the Roman world. We see Philodemus wrote many works on aesthetics, for example, which had not been a preoccupation of the early school. His most important influence was Angie Hobbes. Was, was that on Lucretius, and if so, why? Oh, well, I, I don't know why Lucretius uh, felt that uh, Epicurus spoke sp- specifically to him, but yes, De Rerum Natura, On the Nature of Things, is uh, it's a, a work of genius, I think. I mean, Cicero, who, as we've heard, is no friend of Epicureanism, but he said it has elements of genius in it. Ovid calls it sublime. I mean, it is the most fabulous um, hexameter poem, the power of its imagery, the uh, vividness with, of the depictions of human uh, fears of death and anxious human squabbles over power and wealth. Um, it's, he really, really moves you to want the kind of salvation that he believes Epicurus is offering. Is he paying tribute to Epicurus throughout this poem? Do we know? uh, Oh yes, no no question about it. I mean, he treats Epicurus, I would say, as a quasi... He says he was a god. A a, a god. I mean, of course, that's a loaded (laughs) um, thing to say, given what the Epicureans felt about the gods. Uh, So it's it's no surprise to me that when uh, the Renaissance, as we'll hear probably in a bit, uh, rediscovers uh, Epicureanism, it does so through Lucretius. It's a poem that really grabs you. Uh, and the, the rhythm and the cadences of its uh, verse, I mean, it's just... Talking about the nature of things. Yes, so absolutely. They're talking about everything, really. Yes, I mean, it, it, it is, yes. It's, and, and, he, and it, also the power of the arguments. Um, and we owe to Lucretius our understanding of certain key elements of Epicureanism. Um, he may well have I'm sure he did get them from Epicurean texts which are lost to us, but we only know about the swerve that we were hearing about earlier, which may or may not create a space for free will. We only know about that from Lucretius. Um, the, the intricate mechanism whereby the images, the, the filmic uh, atomic films that enter our sense organs get uh, transformed into sense impressions that that very intricate mechanism is, is from Lucretius. Did the, did the, James Warren, did the arrival, did the growth and arrival and spread of Christianity um, have an effect on Epicureanism? It's hard to tell whether it had an effect on Epicureanism, but they weren't, uh, I think, comfortable bedfellows. It's very hard to see much common ground between these two views of the world or views of human condition. Um, We've already touched on uh, more than once the idea that Epicurus says we should be made uh, confident not in the knowledge that uh, this life is all that we have and when you die that's it, that's annihilation and that's a good thing for you to come to terms with. And the gods do not interfere in human affairs, that's another difference. They don't interfere in human affairs, they didn't create the world, there is no um, retribution for doing wrong, there's no reward for doing right in this life. So every basic tenet of Christianity... <laughs> More or less. <laughs> uh, ...challenge Epicureanism and the other way around. Absolutely. There yeah. are many other ancient philosophies that are much more friendly to that kind of Christian outlook. Platonism, for example, had a much easier ride. Did this, therefore... Was this an, uh, one of the main factors in the ebbing of the influence of Epicurus at that time in the early years of the uh, 
uh, AD years? I think it's quite possible. I mean, yeah. we know that, nevertheless, various ancient texts that talk about Epicureanism continued to be copied and read, otherwise we might not have had them at all. Um, but there was, I think, an unease dealing with Epicurean uh, yeah. thought. I've got to push forward about 1,000 or 1,200 <laughs> years just for the final question. When did Epicureanism re-emerge in the West, in the knowledge bank, as it were, and become effective again? Could we go around the table? Start with yeah. you, Angela. In 1417, yeah. Poggio, who had, was a former papal secretary of the now disgraced Pope uh, John the Twenty Third, had time on his hands, and he went travelling in Germany, uh, visiting the German monasteries, searching for the pagan texts that were his private hobby. And we think in the Benedictine Abbey of Fulda, he just by chance pulled down a copy of De Rerum Natura, which had been gathering dust for hundreds of years and he was the man who reintroduced it into the West and initially there was a very interesting debate actually between uh, Christians and followers of Epicurus about whether Epicureanism could be assimilated into the Christian faith and Moore and Erasmus have a very uh, have a fascinating uh, discussion about that but it's, it's really with the rise of the new science um, at the end of the 16th and in the 17th centuries that you get the philosopher scientists like Bacon, Galileo, um, Gassendi in France thinking that Epicureanism was extremely congenial to the mechanistic theories of the universe that they were developing. James Warren, do you want to add to that? No, but I would add just that even in the 17th century, when there was a more of an interest, perhaps as a result of Gassendi's commentaries on Diogenes Laertius and so on, even then I think there was an attempt to uh, try to accommodate some idea of divine causation in our cosmos within the Epicurean system. So they weren't going to revive this wholesale. Um, there were still qualms uh, that were strong enough that that meant that they really had to qualify the what was the unadulterated Epicurean worldview. Yeah, I mean... Gis oh, sorry. Sorry, no. No, I mean, Gassendi says that God created the atoms and God has ordained all the movements of the atoms. David Tudley. Well, not much to add to, to what's just been said, but uh, it is worth saying that Gassendi, who's just been mentioned, is a particularly important figure because not only is he... Um, a, a leading scientific and philosophical thinker of the 17th century, but he was also a scholar of Epicurean texts, and he brought the two together, um, as no one previously had managed to do. Well, thank you very much, Angie Hobbs, James Warren and David Sedley, and next week we'll be talking about Ice Ages. Thank you for listening. There are many more Radio 4 arts and discussion programmes to download for free. Find these on the website at bbc.co.uk slash radio4.